Ethics, Engagement, and Action. This is part of a series of events and exhibitions based on artist, activist, and educator Mark Strandquist's work with Performing Statistics, which connects incarcerated teens, artists, and Virginia's top legal experts to transform the juvenile justice system. Mark Strandquist has an impressive CV. It includes recent solo exhibitions at University of Michigan, Art 180 in Richmond, Rutgers University, Lycoming College, and many other places. He's presented at College Art Association, the Society for Photographic Educators, the Aperture Foundation, and Columbia College's Center for Book and Paper Arts. He's taught courses at International Center of Photography, VCU, Corcoran College of Art, University of Richmond, and again, many other places. He also has a long list of screenings, grants, residencies, public projects, and other honors. While his work is often rooted in photography, as you'll see, it's activated by social process and by viewer interaction, and he'll tell you more about that soon. But first, I want to give some acknowledgments. I first learned of Mark Strandquist's work through John Henry, his right here in the front row. Uh, yeah, he's curator of Old Furnace Artist Residency, uh, OFAR for short, which is an artist residency here in Harrisonburg that focuses on social justice. And uh, OFAR is actually co-hosting this visit. Uh, John was familiar with anti-jail work uh, through the local organization Better Together, which has done events in the past. John's currently finishing his MFA, uh, in graduate sculpture, uh, and he's the one who proposed this project to me, uh, and I moved forward with the invitation after looking at the work and being so impressed by it. Um, and you can come back to this spot hopefully soon. You'll see uh, John's thesis work right in this space over here. So in an act of synchronicity, someone else had also <coughs> invited Mark Strandquist to come to Harrisonburg during the same time frame. And that was Tom Brenneman, a local youth worker, who's teaching a course on juvenile justice law at Eastern Mennonite University this semester. Uh, he's an amazing activist and organizer, as you can tell from all the events that happened from this. Uh, we started working together and brainstormed along with EMU history professor Dr. Mark Sollen, who invited Mark as the Albert N. Kime lecture series, which will be tomorrow night. And with art professor Cindy Gussler, who organized an exhibition at EMU, and also with Leah Rosenwasser, who had ideas for how to activate this into our downtown spaces. So in addition to the JMU exhibition, which you may have seen at New Image Gallery tonight, our photography and new media space, uh, there's also an exhibition in this building, Step Into Our Cell, uh, here in the Duke, Duke Critique space, and that's managed by sculpture professor Greg Stewart. A fourth exhibition will open at the Gallery at Laughing Dog for First Fridays downtown in March. And alumni, Keith uh, Mills and Kathy Kraft, are in the helm there. Uh, these exhibitions are all ongoing after tonight, so be sure to pick up one of the free newspapers uh, with an insert so you can find out all of the events and things going on. So before I introduce our moderator to get started, I have a whole lot of thank yous to give. I'm grateful for the support of the Madison Collaborative Ethical Reasoning in Action. And I think you'll see how the eight key questions really frame the dialogue that's evoked by this work. If you haven't heard about that and want to know more, uh, there are little handouts and magnets over at the uh, food table. So you can pick one up and check that out. Uh, the School of Art, Design, and Art History has supported this project in many ways, especially Gar Gallery Director Gary Freeberg, who got all of this ready for us tonight, and our amazing School Director, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Schwartz, who helped me with formulating the concept and is a huge supporter. I'm also grateful for the support of the Institute for Innovation in Health and Human Services, especially to Joshua Diamond from the Office of Children and Youth, who worked with the youth on our panel, uh, and we're so glad they're here to give that voice. Um, also, to the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, uh, with Dr. Mika Polanka stepping forward to connect this with her class on transforming juvenile justice. 
We're also doing this in partnership with EMU History and the Visual and Communication Arts Department. So you can see this as a true interdisciplinary project that spans across Harrisonburg. I'm of course grateful to Mark Strandquist for being the inspiration behind all of this, for sharing his dreams with us, and for the panelists who will share their stories and dreams as well. Um, and there are so many people that have been part of this project, I'm not going to name you all, but please know that we are grateful for everything that you have contributed. So now on to our moderator who will take over. In another act of synchronicity, when I was in a meeting with Dr. Rhonda Zingraff about a project we worked on together, I happened to mention how excited I was about Mark Strandquist's work and about his future visit to campus. I knew Dr. Zingraff as the Associate Dean of the College of Health and Behavioral Studies and also as Director of JMU's Institute for Innovation in Health and Human Services. And I knew that in these roles, she represents many community health programs that provide real world educational experiences for their students, and also that it just directly connects uh, JMU campus and students with the community. Uh, what I didn't realize uh, is that she also is a sociologist with expertise in social inequalities social justice studies and criminal justice studies and that before coming to JMU she worked directly within the prison system in her position as director of undergraduate research and department head for sociology and social work at Meredith College in Raleigh North Carolina so needless to say she was very interested and offered to help so here she is tonight as our moderator and I'd like to now turn the event over to her. So I'm wondering if we need the microphone. Do we need it or can you hear? We need it. We need it. That's better? Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to celebrate that all of you are here. Uh, and I want you to know, as you're listening and reflecting on all of our discussion with our um, wonderful panelists this evening, I want you to know that there was a large group of people, not quite the size of this group, but a large group of people that started the day this morning at City Hall here in Harrisonburg. People representing a lot of different stakeholders and interest groups from around our town who came together because they would like to see uh, the accomplishment of some change in the way we are approaching issues that affect our youth, particularly as they spill into the juvenile justice system, and asking some really strong questions and hoping to achieve some really admirable goals. And one of our panelists, Jerry Thomas, uh, managed to rise with the chickens this morning in Richmond in order to find her way over here and be a part of that uh, session this morning. So I do think that our assembly this evening is an important uh, signal that there is a growing level of attention appropriately to these concerns that we will explore with our panelists this evening and that have been, you know, so um, so compellingly presented to us for some reflection thanks to the work of our artist, Mark, tonight. So uh, I don't want to stake out too much time as the moderator. I want to move on so that we have most of our time for our panelists to talk to you and for you to raise some questions with them. Uh, I welcome you to this particular campus, and I want to emphasize that it is the hope of this university to be very um, collaborative with all of the interest groups in our community to be able to come together and achieve some improvements in what we're doing to make the uh, life chances for youth in our area and in the Shenandoah Valley look brighter and brighter. Uh, so we thank you for being here and helping us with that. I will introduce the people who are on our panel and then we will have some additional uh, information and stimulation provided by a couple of our panelists. Uh, at the far end here, uh, this is uh, Mark Sandquist, 
Uh, he is an artist and an activist and an educator who is responsible for performing statistics. The work that connects incarcerated teens, artists, Virginia's top legal experts to transform the juvenile justice system. He teaches art and activism as um, an adjunct faculty member for VCU and at the International Center of Photography and he's a professional fellow at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. At the core of Mark's practice is the belief that those most impacted by the criminal justice system are the experts that society needs to listen to. That those most impacted by the criminal justice system are the experts society needs to listen to. That would be the incarcerated individuals and their family members and those in re-entry, all of those who are affected by all of the things that con converge and collide in our criminal justice system. By connecting those directly affected with many community experts and political stakeholders, we should be able to create change. Uh, Mark's projects include working with incarcerated youth, uh, working with incarcerated men, women, and teens. He has organized teams of lawyers, artists, and formerly incarcerated individuals to help facilitate free legal clinics that have helped to clear the record of thousands of people. Uh, beyond his advocacy efforts, his projects have received multiple awards and have reached wide audiences through the New York Times, The Guardian, NPR, The Washington Post, the PBS NewsHour, a multitude of other media outlets. So we have quite an impressive and accomplished guest on our panel tonight. Thank you, Mark Sandquist. Jerry Thomas, sitting next to him. Just Children, Attorney, Legal Aid Justice Center. Jerry Thomas works with um, the um, Just Children Justice Center in Richmond, and she started her career there in 2011 as a Skadden Fellow representing incarcerated youth who were experiencing education and reentry issues. She has a BA from William and Mary in social justice and community advocacy. She has a law degree from the University of Virginia Law School. She was one of five students selected there for the first class of the Law and Public Service Program. She's a member of the Virginia State Bar. She served as the co-chair of the Young Lawyers Conference Commission on Women and Minorities in the Legal Profession. She's a co-author of Virginia's Education Law and Advocacy Manual, and she has been selected as a National Juvenile Justice Network Youth Justice Leadership Institute Fellow. Currently, she also serves as the campaign manager of a program known as RISE, R-I-S-E. RISE stands for Reinvest in Supportive Environments for Youth. And the RISE campaign focuses on investing in community-based alternatives to youth incarceration. Thank you, Jury, for your presence <coughs> with us. Next, we have Josh Neal, Brianna, Alirano, did I get that right? Ariano. Ariano. And Jasmine Neal. The Neal siblings are keeping themselves in good behavior by positioning someone critically and strategically in between them. But for their role on the panel this evening, they are representatives of our Youth Council in Harrisonburg um, at the Institute for Innovation in Health and Human Services here at JMU. One of the programs that we sponsor there, that we host there, is the Youth Council for Harrisonburg Rockingham Youth. Um, this is an outlet and a space where the youth of our community come together to plan, to implement community service projects, to figure out how to make some hard decisions in life, and perhaps more than anything else, it's a place where they can build some positive and caring relationships among themselves and have something that they can count on because they trust and know and understand one another. Uh, this is outside of all the other domains where they spend their time, and it's a safe harbor. And we're glad that we have such a place here in town, and we're glad to have our youth here to join us and share their perspectives with us. Thank you.
And seated next to them is the amazing Howard Zier, widely known as the grandfather of restorative justice. So for all of you in the room who haven't been in a room with Dr. Zier before, but have read articles, books, or tracts, or manuscripts, or have heard interviews or public service announcements about restorative justice, this is the source, uh, and the source is with us tonight. Dr. Zaire started as a practitioner and a theorist in restorative justice in the late 1970s. He was uh, implementing the foundational uh, stones to build this great um, field, and he has led hundreds of events that span more than 25 countries, including trainings and consultations on restorative justice, victim offender conferencing, judicial reform, other criminal justice matters. He has served on the Victims Advisory Group of the United States Sentencing Commission. He's on various other advisory boards. He has earned an undergraduate degree from Morehouse and a graduate degree from the University of Chicago and a doctor's degree from Rutgers University. His work as the photographer and grandfather of restorative justice includes stories of people serving life sentences for crime, people who have suffered as crime victims, and people whose parents are incarcerated. So he has deeply probed all of the sides of our criminal justice system and its challenges. Dr. Zier, thank you for being on our panel. So with that as an introduction to you all, more detailed about your panelists tonight, I will invite Jeri and Mark to come forward and to show you some things that will provide you with some added uh, food for thought. Two are juvenile state prisons, 
um, for felony grand larceny. And in Virginia, we have the lowest felony grand larceny charge, $200. Most states on average is 1,000 or a little above 1,000. Um, so that in particular, I think, grabbed a lot of people's attention because the concern of we're making felons out of young kids for $200, which is, again, the lowest threshold. Um, but also when you look at the needs of young people who are in our facilities, you have very high rates of mental health needs, you have disproportionate numbers of youth with special education needs, it's about 40% of the youth there, and you see 76% with mental health needs. But when we talk about the outcomes for young people who are incarcerated in our state facilities, these are the outcomes. So 73.4%, almost three out of four youth who leave our juvenile correctional centers or juvenile prisons are reconvicted of another offense. Um, I recently saw a presentation by the director of the Department of Juvenile Justice that said about half of them are reincarcerated. So when you look at these numbers, we're spending a lot uh, and we're not getting the outcome. So that has really pushed this issue to the forefront. And it's been through the work uh, that Mark and myself and others who are part of the RISE Coalition and the RISE for Youth Coalition and campaign to bring this issue to our state legislators. So right now in Virginia, the General Assembly is actually considering this issue. They are considering the idea of, okay, well, what are our state youth facilities doing? Should we still have them? Should we be reinvesting in something else? Should we be creating different types of facilities? Should we be creating community-based alternatives? And so what we did in this picture, this is at a state budget hearing in Richmond. There, there are state budget hearings across the state on the same day, in early January, was we had an opportunity to, to speak with them about this issue. Um, Mark and, and our colleague Trey Hart uh, had the opportunity to play the messages from the youth that we work with as a part of the Performing Statistics Project directly to the legislators, to bring their, their work, their, the youth voices, directly to legislators. So, I already explained uh, Rise for Youth, but just to talk about the fact that there are alternatives to youth incarceration, and one of the alternatives is a program called Youth Advocates uh, Program. They actually have a report called Safely Home, so if you can look up safety at home and you can find a whole report about alternatives to youth incarceration and what good alternatives look like. Um, and their program is really focused on training up and paying advocates from the community, from the community where the kids are from, people that the kids and their family can trust and feel comfortable with, and having them become a part of the support, the support network. Um, there's also programs that we'll hear more about social <coughs> justice, there's functional family therapy, there's a whole host of programs. You can actually go to blueprintsprograms.com. Um, there's also a model program guide that the Office of Juvenile Justice Policy puts out that talks about these are programs that work. These are programs we already have information on that are working in other states. Why can't we bring these to Virginia? Well, that's a part of what we're trying to do through the Rise for Youth campaign. We're advocating that instead of investing money into our system of, of incarceration in large state prisons, we need to reinvest that funding away and, and take it to more community-based um, alternatives to the incarceration. So with that, So I'm going to go through 40 slides in seven minutes. Um, so the performing statistics, our slogan is prisons don't work, and if you, know, you saw the statistics, if you were the CEO of a business and you had a 75% failure rate, where 75% of the time the service that you're spending millions of dollars to provide is failing to, to, to serve the youth, failing to, to serve the family, to serve communities, to serve other people involved in those convictions, I think that CEO would, would, in that structure, the business would, would, would be replaced. So what's missing in those stats 
and what sort of where Drew and I kind of started working together was the, the youth that are most affected by that. And so performing statistics began with the question, you know, what would uh, juvenile justice reform look like if it was led by an incarcerated youth? And then how can we uh, connect those youth with amazing advocates, artists, teachers, educators, trauma reform specialists to amplify uh, their voices, to be bridges uh, between their voices, policymakers, people all across the state. Um, so this summer, for eight weeks, we worked with an amazing group of youth from the Richmond Detention Center um, who were able to leave their facility uh, three days a week, wear their own clothes, there were no guards in the room. If we're going to be talking about replacing this system with something that, that works better for communities, works better for our youth, makes, makes us all safer, um, how can we not only talk about it and represent it, but model it? So um, our program itself, um, we have mentors that were formerly incarcerated that were working with the youth, who were amazing advocates and mentors. Uh, we had trauma informed specialists help us uh, create the curriculum. Um, no guards in the room, uh, all these things that really create a space where the youth could trust, could, could um, uh, feel comfortable to really kind of open up and create some of the most powerful work I've ever encountered. Um, so basically, every week, we would have Dream would kind of come uh, and talk about certain things in the criminal justice system. So they were learning about the criminal justice system, developing their own sort of advocacy skills, and then taking their personal experiences and creative skills that we were teaching and kind of combining them together to create advocacy projects. So they made amazing portraits, like you, some of you have seen in the images or in the installations. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly just to get through a lot of it, but. Um, all of these are in the newspaper and in the exhibit. And in the newspaper, this beautiful thing right here, um, you can, there's phone numbers at the bottom of every page, and you can actually hear each youth speak directly to you. Um, so you would hear this gentleman speak to you as you're looking through the newspaper. Um, again, this is about you know, not looking to these youth as unfortunates, not looking to these youth as criminals, but looking to them as people with, with incredible expertise, knowledge, potential, teaching skills, leadership skills, and, and connecting them with people to nurture and, and really support the, um, they, we taught them silk screen design, they made amazing posters, these, these were turned into t-shirts like the one I'm wearing, um, given out in hundreds, um, this is our space we're working in, it's Molly Fair from the Justine's Collective, which is an awesome group. Um, we went to a radio station where they recorded their own radio personal um, public service announcements about what they wish people knew about incarcerated youth. Wood burn messages for people to remember to the floor planks of a jail cell. Um, and then how does this how does this go beyond just representing an issue? So everything we created um, is it's not just something to die and, and end up in a, in a gallery, but it's an object for people to take with them to deploy in their communities. So the posters we've given out. And tons of these posters, um, the jail cell with the wood burn messages, the bars, we're asking people, and, and we've gotten thousands of responses, what can you do to create a world where no youth are locked up? So how can the exhibit itself become a space to kind of bring in other people's knowledge? Everybody in this room has something they can do to, su to, to support this movement. Um, and, and creating a space where, where the exhibit itself becomes kind of a collective think tank. There's Andy Block, Director of the Department of Juvenile Justice, underneath an awesome abolitionist sign. Um, doing a really cool town halls, using the exhibition in a multitude of ways. The Chief of Police, Albert Durham, who's an amazing man, came. We say that we believe that these youth are experts and they have a lot to share. But when the police chief comes, and he is so floored that after like 10 minutes, he says, all of my recruits need to see this work. All of my recruits need this to, to use this as a classroom. Um, so then we work together with our team uh, to create, to use the exhibition to, to basically train every single police recruit in Richmond, um, which was this really amazing, arts immersive um, experience, very dialogue heavy, where the police were engaging with the art and then having dialogue with uh, policy experts, uh, childhood development folks, um, family members who've had kids in prison, and so on. We're meeting with the chief next week to start to train all of the officers around the city. And how does this get beyond the gallery, right? A gallery has a self-selecting audience, right? Only certain people go to galleries for a lot of reasons. So spaces are coded, uh, accessibility, class, all these things. Um, so how can we make sure that, that this work is getting out of those spaces? So we did a, a justice parade 
Uh, the youth wrote their own protest chants, um, and then we worked with musicians uh, and, and amazing drummers. This kid is the best drummer ever. Um, to go on the public streets and basically perform those protest chants to turn the exhibition into a people-powered mobile art exhibit. Um, where you have the statistics, you have everybody wearing the t-shirts that students, the teens designed. Um, these, the photos that they made were then turned into giant banners that became incredible protest tools. This is in November and I'm wearing short shorts. Climate change is real. Um, this is Gina. Gina is one of our amazing team mentors. Uh, without her, this project would not have been possible. Um, so you can see some of the awesome work from that. Uh, we marched through black traffic for a mile during rush hour. Uh, no issues. Um, I think when you frame things as a celebratory, this is what happens when all these experts come together to tackle a social issue. Uh, it's a constructive way to kind of engage with it, and I think you see a lot better outcomes. We have 10 seconds left. I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, and then, so, you know, if we're bringing it to the public spaces, how can we also go to cultural centers of power that also often silence or exclude these voices? So we went to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. We're part of an event where 20,000 people saw the work, signed petitions, took art. As Drew was, saying, Drew was saying, we went to the General Assembly and played the audio files um, over the microphone to a group of old white men. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but General Assembly members. And, uh, we've got the newspaper as a way also to get the work up to, you know, we don't want it to die, right? This, it's a huge opportunity and a responsibility to work with youth that have this much knowledge, to just do it and, and, and exhibit in, in Richmond and to just say, pat ourselves on the back, look at the great work we did. That would be such, just a horrible thing. So we're trying, we're working with teachers to turn the newspaper into an open source curriculum that can enter and trespass into to schools and all kinds of spaces. Um, we just got a crazy half million dollar grant, which I'm so excited about. Um, and that means three years. Jerry has to work with me for three more years. Um, youth Advocacy Network, we're building to work with folks to use as they get out of the system to continue have to have paid opportunities to, to be amazing leaders and advocates. Expanding our police training across Virginia. People would be interested in doing that work here. And we'd love to get, get involved. So. Um, but thank you for having us. There's so many things. John, everybody. I can't say what an honor it is to be, to share the stage with some local youth advocates. I want that t-shirt so bad. If you have extras, I'll pay for it. And Howard, I, your, your reputation precedes you, and it's a crazy honor to share the stage. Thank you for all your work.
Two, justice for juveniles that you believe the artist among us, and there may be lots of artists in this um, assembled group this evening. What are some barriers to justice for youth that you believe the artist among us could make more visible? If prisons don't work, what's getting in the way of our being able to just move beyond them? Where are the barriers? Is, you know, as, a, as an advocate, I've done lobbying for my organization, but the impact of, I think, hearing directly from young people or hearing the voices or seeing the pictures, that is, I think, a real game changer. Um, it's so easy for the legislators who might not have any contact with young people who've experienced the system to stereotype the young people, to stereotype their family, I actually sat in a meeting with the legislator last year, and I was there with my colleague, who is a former client of mine, and who spent seven years in a juvenile correctional center. And what the legislator said, oh, these kids are just knuckleheads, just, you know, said all these things, not, not even realizing that my colleague was there. And so I think that, I think that, you know, breaking to the, the attention of, of folks who, have some power to make these decisions and, and control the first streets, breaking, breaking the, the faces, the reality uh, of what kids are facing, you know, through their own voices. And that's why we want to do the youth advocacy network. We want to have formerly incarcerated youth. We want to, you know, make sure that they are at the forefront of talking about this. And we want to do that through um, through art. We want to do that through training. We want to do that through just different ways that help support So, I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered all of your questions or if anyone else has anything to add to it, but I think finding that, that voice and, and bringing that to mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really agree with you on that. I, I'm in high school and I see a lot of the times where not even our teachers support us. Sometimes we are told we're supposed to fit inside this box, like because we are a certain race, when we are in a certain class who are not taking honors classes, I am told, are you going to graduate on that? Like, I was not, I, I don't know, like, like I was lesser than those kids that he teaches in his AP classes because I was not able to fit an AP class in my schedule. So I was now just some simple Mexican sitting in a classroom with writing packets because, I don't know, like the, the fact that I would put down lower for my race got to be a, a bad kid because I couldn't be in a normal classroom was, was kind of like eye-opening. This teacher didn't realize that I was on academic team, that I am taking two dual enrollment classes. And it's kind of hard to think that we are supposed to change the world when we're not, we're not thought we can change the world. We're, 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 we are thought to be put into, and we're thought that we are here because we have to be. And those teachers need our babysitters. That's what they feel like they are when they teach regular classes or BSA classes or like, where are you? Where were you? Class started a minute ago. I was speaking to another teacher down the hall. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. I just really agree that we are stereotyped and we have to break those stereotypes and it's, and it's up to us to stand up together and do that. So there's two things. There's barriers for the youth themselves. 
Um, that's like what you're what you're saying, and what we talk about is the youth that we're working with have experienced years of basically being told through actions, through words, through language, through uh, where they're able to live, where they're able to go to school, what sort of you know all these things that they are that their lives matter less, or if at all. And I think you know I've worked with youth in the system who've said if you thought you were going to be dead by 21 or incarcerated, why would you care about school? Why would you? Um, why do we care about being an active citizen? Um, you know, uh, we've talked about this a lot. Like, there's a lot of youth in this country who are surviving childhood and experiencing it. And I think that that's a huge barrier as ad advocates and, and as youth allies to break through that. To break through that, but like, it's not even, I don't want to call it apathy. It's because it's, it's just not trusting that they have a voice, that their voice can um, impact change. So, you know, I think this year, you know, with um, working with the youth to train every police recruit, with doing projects that tens of thousands of people have seen, going into this next summer set of workshops, we'll be able to show that work to the youth, and I think that'll help sort of them trust and go along with us. Um, but as far as other people, I mean, I think art is not an end in of itself. It's a, it's a, it can create a humanistic entry point into what are incredibly complex and systemic issues and then you need advocates, and you need youth advocates, and you need you know, everybody in this room to take it to the next level. So we can create that stage to really get beyond that, but if, otherwise, if we don't, you know, it's just gonna end in this newspaper to get thrown in or something. Well, I think we're all grateful for all that you've done to make what would have been maybe invisible more visible. And when that happens, it's adding to the dialogue, it's raising the, it's elevating and it invites more community dialogue and attention. Um, I think another major part of what is the barrier is that when we start talking about how prisons don't work, people um, with the best intentions in the world can sometimes feel like they're just uh, at a dead end. They don't know, well, what is supposed to work? What else are we supposed to do? And we tend to have this um, backward-looking fear that if we're not going to use prisons, which were designed to be more humane than what we did, what, in the medieval world, then what else is there that we can do? Something has to be there. So I think we do have the grandfather of the answer for some of that here. So I will invite Dr. Zare um, to, um, to give you some thoughts about what restorative justice can mean, and that becomes another insight that helps us to overcome a barrier. Thank you, Congress. Mark's uh, comments about restorative justice as a business at the beginning remind me of a judge friend of mine who says, you know, in business, you really want to have customer lawyer. I want your customers coming back. He says, what a great business I have. My customers keep coming back. <laughs> and he says, furthermore, the more, more I fail, the more money they give me. Uh, same judge says something that I think is, he likes to address the audience. He likes to say, suppose a doctor from the 18th century was dropped down at Centera Hospital. Well, would he know what to do or she know what to do? Probably be a heat. It would be, it'd, it'd be a whole new world. They would have no where to start. Now, suppose the same thing happened to an 18th century jurist. They were dropped into courtroom. They would know where to sit. They would know basically what's going on. What's wrong? Why hasn't, you know, why have we made all this change in the scientific community and the legal system? There's a couple of barriers in a couple of minutes I want to talk about. I think there's three kind of barriers that I think about a lot. One of them is the rigidity of a legal system that uses so privileges to rational and logical and has so little room for the intuitive and the emotional and, and the other parts of who we are. The second is the interests that are built into that, all the latent functions. The criminal justice system serves all kind of functions besides the official ones, including the economic interest behind it. And the biggest one is the lens we use when we think about crime and justice. We have a, our conventional wisdom about what justice is really binds us in. I'm really, this project brings together two of them, my passion. One is the, my belief in the role of art the ability of art to connect people, to get people to think new thoughts, to, to, 
to address the othering we do that separates people and those kind of things. And the other interest, of course, is in the justice side. You know, it's widely recognized, finally, that our legal system is deeply flawed uh, with destructive unintended consequences. And I believe that that's not repairable by a few tweaks or a few reforms or even by adding alternatives uh, or even by reducing mass incarceration, even, all the, even though all those things are important. We really need a radical rethinking of what we're doing. Einstein's famous for saying you can't get out of a problem by using the same thinking that got you into it. Uh, we really need a new vision of what justice ought to be. And it's one, and I think art has an important place in this because we need a vision that's much more holistic, that it addresses, that comes from and addresses us as whole people, including the intuitive and the creative and the, and the emotional and the spiritual. The one involves the whole person. So art has a lot to say in that. And also the role of people impacted, as we've heard. The young people who are caught up in this thing, the people who have been harmed by actions, all of those voices need to be heard, and art really provides a space to do that. I've been advocating, spent my career using restorative justice, at least as a catalyst. I don't know if that's the new vision, but at least as a catalyst for discussion around that, around the new vision. I think there's lots of possibilities for that. And uh, one of my projects, as was mentioned here, was a book called Doing Life. It's reflections, sometimes it's reflections of men and women serving life sentences. It was a photograph, it was portraits and interviews. And at the end of the book, I said this. We've been conditioned to believe that art is a supreme expression of our individual selves, in our, that in our creativity we display our utter independence. I am coming to believe that our art may be more powerful and serve us better if it were to draw us together to bring us to greater mutual understanding. I am committed to doing photography, and I would add art, that speaks to the power of connectedness, that calls us into relationship, relationship with other people, with the environment, with our community. I want to end by just something that came to mind as we were talking about this. When we began with those statistics at the beginning of the year, it reminded me of what happened in New Zealand in the 1980s. I've had the privilege to spend a lot of time in New Zealand. In the 1980s, New Zealand was facing a crisis very much like ours. One of the highest, maybe the highest incarceration rate for young people in the world. And surprise, surprise, we were in there. The vast majority were people of color, Maori, uh, the indigenous Maori of New Zealand. They tried to do a kind of reform like we often talk about, and it didn't pass. And they went back and did a radical rethink. Uh, and at the core of it, they didn't know about restorative justice at the time, but it was very much of a restorative process. And then they learned about restorative justice and adjusted it. And it was really very responsive. So the Maori came to the, to the Pakia, the Europeans of New Zealand, and they said, look, this system is institutionally racist. They said, it's, it's culturally inappropriate and it's institutionally racist. We need something more appropriate for our cultural tradition. And today in New Zealand, for serious crime, you're not supposed to go to court. You're supposed to go to what's essentially a restorative conference. It's called a family group conference. And in that conference, you're supposed to figure out what needs to, what is owed the victim, if there's a victim, what needs to happen in the young person's life. And only if you can't do it there are you supposed to go to court, basically. What happened was they went from the highest incarceration rate for young people in the world to 150 secure beds in the whole country. Judges told me that some of the judges said I went from every day on the bench dealing with youth matters to one half or one bed. It can be done, but it requires a radical rethink. And that's, that gives me hope because what they've done, in our system we've taken the worst case that we can imagine, and we've made that decision. <coughs> Everybody goes to court, which is a really a limited resource. What they have said is, look, reserve the court for the tough cases when they can't resolve. Let people solve these things together. And that has radically changed. And that gives me hope. Thanks.
acknowledged it in the beginning that uh, part of what was uh, brought in to support this work this evening was our Madison Collaborative Ethical Listening in Action. It, it asks us all to think about the ethical challenges that we're confronting uh, on any issue. So for us tonight, it's this issue. Prisons don't work. And what are the ethical challenges? How would we recognize them? How might we express those? And I think that, um, in my view, there are a couple of different ways to think about ethical challenges and with regard to this topic. One of them has to do with what happens to youth once they come into some interaction with law enforcement, with the courts, with the detention system. What happens once they are kind of caught into that snare and what are the ethical concerns that we have uh, for that part of their story. But there's an equally compelling set of ethical questions that has to do with what's going on before they ever get there. What's going on in what we come to know increasingly as a kind of a pipeline experience where before they are brought in to the court, before they are ever facing the risk of detention, there are features going on in their lives that should be causing all of us to raise some ethical questions about how things are uh, experienced by the youth of our society. So you know, on behalf of our need to really grapple with some ethical issues, I'd like to see if we have some thoughts from the panelists about some of the ethical dilemmas you see, what's going on with youth before they ever get to law enforcement that is really a serious concern. We need It needs attention. And then what are the things that are happening once they are caught up in that net? Uh, and what happens in courts, in detention centers, in the probation uh, management uh, that raises some ethical questions? Do you have some suggestions on this? Society, 
Um, but most important, or not most, but equally important, makes the social issues that lead to such high rates of incarceration, all the things that Jaree talked about, that concept that youth are surviving, not experiencing childhood, um, makes those social issues invisible as well. And so I think for me, my call to action is to not only work to make the voices of those most affected by the system that have been you know, systematically silenced and excluded from this conversation, um, uh, publicly, not only visible, but um, you know, an integral part of the conversation, um, but to, 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 to partner with amazing experts that can layer on this, the structural, the, the systemic critiques and conversation. And thankfully, on this panel, we have three amazing youth experts, and I don't want to talk about youth advocacy and then have a bunch of adults talk. So I would love to know if you guys feel comfortable um, one or a couple of things that you think could happen to, to create a world where no youth are, are locked up. So one or a few things that you think are needed to create that world. Because I think that's, that's where art can, can be. It's a laboratory for us to envision a world um, that doesn't exist. I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> Because that's who they actually are. They're not. They're not at this point providing 